Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm excited to introduce this virtual event with Bill Keller presenting his new book, What's Prison For? Joined in conversation by Jill Abramson. Thanks so much for joining us virtually this evening. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues alongside our in-person programming this fall, bringing authors and their work to our digital community. Find our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and shop our shelves from home. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. We'll get through as many as time allows. Shortly in the chat, I will be posting a link to purchase What's Prison For on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, and of course, indie book selling. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Bill Keller is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, most recently serving as editor in chief of the Marshall Project, a nonprofit independent news organization focused on crime and punishment in the United States. He joined as founding editor in March 2014 after 30 years at the New York Times as a correspondent, editor, and op ed columnist. During his eight years, 2003 through 2011, as executive editor of the Times, the newspaper won 18 Pulitzer Prizes. Bill is joined on our digital stage this evening by Jill Abramson, senior lecturer at Harvard University, columnist for The Guardian, and also a former executive editor at The New York Times. She was the first woman to serve as Washington Bureau Chief Managing Editor and Executive Editor. They are here with us today to discuss Bill's new book, What's Prison For? Punishment and Rehabilitation in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Publishers Weekly calls it detailed and emphatic. This is an airtight case for reform. And Senator Cory Booker writes, Bill Keller has been a shining light at our broken criminal, has been shining a light at our broken criminal justice system for years and powerfully argues that America can and must do better. To do nothing or say nothing only reinforces the current nightmare. I hope you read this book learn, and in some way, join the growing bipartisan efforts to bring about urgently needed change. We're very pleased to host this event this evening. Bill and Jill, the digital podium is yours. Thank you. It's, it's great to have everyone joining us to discuss Bill's very provocative uh, and interesting book about uh, the state of prisons in an era of mass incarceration and some possible solutions to some of the deep societal problems that have been caused by the era of mass incarceration. Uh, and to hear the words Bill and Jill is very nice because when Bill was executive editor, I was his managing editor, sitting right next to him and riding sidecar. And I saw maybe dozens of times reporters and journalists stream into Bill's office to ask for book leaves. They wanted to write books. And Bill would always say, books are not for my metabolism. Um, I'm gonna not be a book author, but here is this wonderful book. Uh, it's not overwhelmingly long. It's sort of a, a perfect length. And uh, why suddenly have you decided that maybe this book in any case is is right for your metabolism, Bill. Well, as you've demonstrated, it's a short book. So the, the hurdle wasn't quite as high as some other books I could write. Uh, I spent five years at the Marshall Project 
uh, in the company of some really smart reporters and editors. I learned a lot. And after, after five years, when I stepped down and handed over the Marshall Project to a successor, another Times woman, um, I felt that I'd learned some things that might be worth putting into a kind of primer on how the how the system works and doesn't work. Um, I, I, the criminal justice system has a, a number of component parts, but prisons are the ones that get that have the most sort of an aura of mystery about them because those walls that keep people in also keep prying eyes out. So they're sort of the, le the least transparent branch compared to even police or courts, prosecutors. Um, so I thought I could maybe demystify the, the, the role of prisons a bit. Yeah, I mean, I was stunned even though I know we do live in an era of mass incarceration to learn at the beginning of your book that there are 2 million Americans in prison right now. And most of them at some point are likely to return to society. So, you know, your book poses the great question, what's prison for? And I think most people think, well, prison is for punishment, but you make a very compelling case in the book that prison should be for rehabilitation uh, because most of these people are coming back into society. And uh, can you explain that a little bit? And, and what types of re rehabilitation are you talking about? Yeah, well, it's approximately 95%. This is the, the statistic, if there's one statistic at the heart of the book, it's the, the fact that something like 95% of the people who are in prisons and jails will get out. That's like 600,000 people a year are set free from state prisons and federal prisons. And it presents society with a choice. Um, do you want those people set, set free into the real world, the, the, the free world, uh, brutalized, lacking in skills that could get them a job, uh, stigmatized, alienated, or do you want to try to prepare them as best you can to be citizens and neighbors? Uh, I, I, I think the choice kind of makes itself. Um, Another, what reinforced that in my reporting experiences, and this, is, this sounds sort of sentimental, um, but there's people who, who work in the criminal justice field like to say, nobody should be defined by the worst thing they've ever done. Uh, and in the time I've spent reporting and then writing this book, uh, I've met a lot of women and men who did awful things, but I don't think they're awful people. I've seen a, a number of people who given a second chance or a third chance, found purpose in their lives and made a real contribution. That's, you know, right now, a week from Tuesday, we're going to be having, you know, elections and it seems that in the final days of many campaigns that crime has become a big issue, especially in New York, where you are speaking from. And politically is, you know, a focus on rehabilitation rather than throw everyone in jail. Is it a tough sell right now because crime rates are rising in many places? It is a tough sell. Uh, the, one of the reasons that we have the mass incarceration situation that we've gotten is because of politicians who basically can't their campaign on fear mongering. You know, it's 
we've been wrestling between uh, over the question of whether pr pr prison is mainly to be to punish or mainly to rehabilitate for 200 years up and down. Um, and I was surprised to learn that in the 20th century, while we were relatively heavy on incarceration compared to our peer countries, um, it was a pretty much a stable rate of incarceration, about 100 people for every 100,000 population. Um, that was true up until the 70s when the country started to take a sharp turn towards punitive and, and the incarceration rate was, became five times what it was before. Um, now that wasn't all because of fear mongering politicians, but it was a combination of factors. One of them was crime was actually going up. Uh, another was drugs and specifically the war on drugs. Uh, right, all, all of this was accelerating during the Reagan years, right? Correct. And, and it was, you know, you had the war on crime, the war on drugs, and you had the white backlash against the black empowerment movement of the 60s and 70s. I mean, race is a part of this, of the DNA of mass incarceration. Um, and the media played a part too. That's, that's one thing that I think we tend to overlook is that um, sensational news stories draw eyeballs. If you're, you know, they say in local TV news, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, right. There's a, there's a, and there's a phrase that some people have used to describe the role that the, the exalted status that police get in society. It's called copaganda. You know, they got pretty good at manipulating the press by feeding them tidbits of information that the competition didn't have. Um, Do you think when we were at the Times, we were not as alert to that as perhaps we should have been? Uh, yeah, I think, I think we were, even the Times was complicit to some extent in it. You know, back in the hysterical period of the 60s and 70s, when Hillary Clinton was talking about super predators, this, this ostensible generation of young men, black men who had no conscience and were rampaging in the streets. Um, I like to think that we've gotten better at it, at least the mainstream media, have, they write uh, much more than they did about mass incarceration and the toll that it takes on communities. They write about solitary confinement and the effect that has on the, on the brains of people who are subjected to yeah, it. I mean, it, it's devastating um, yeah. in so many cases. But then you see something like, like bail reform in New York and um, not this isn't something that I would attribute to the Times or or the Washington Post, but um, you know that the, the candidates who are the Republican candidates are seizing on every instance of somebody who got out on without bail and committed a crime. There's no data to support the fact that that's a, a, a phenomenon that it. That, I feel in many ways, just to underscore your excellent point, is that we're back in 1988 when in the presidential campaign, there was a notorious ad um, about, you know, a, a black prisoner who had been let out on furlough and committed a crime. And yeah, Willie Horton, the so-called Willie Horton ad. And, you know, that was wrapped around the Democratic nominee, Michael Dukakis's neck. And, you know, in subsequent years, it seemed that people came to a conclusion that it was a reprehensible ad that 
distorted the issue, but we're kind of right back where we started uh, in some ways. And it wasn't just Republicans who were banging the gong for, for uh, of fear of crime. Uh, I mean, the 1994 uh, Crime Act was a, a Bill Clinton sponsored piece of legislation and the chairman of the Judiciary Committee that passed it was Joe Biden. Uh, it it uh, instituted uh, mandatory minimum sentences. It took away prisoners access to um, federal grants for college education. It, it, it was, it was a, a really harsh piece of legislation which uh, Hillary Clinton had to apologize for in her presidential campaign and which Joe Biden has been trying to make amends for. You look um, in the book, I'm looking for the exact pages at, yes, you know, some examples from Europe, which has historically had, you know, a, a different approach to crime and imprisonment. And you found a couple of examples in US prisons of kind of pilot pilot experiments of importing some of those methods. You talk about um, a Scandinavian program at, you know, a, a, a prison in Pennsylvania and, right. and also um, out at San Quentin. And I, I was hoping maybe for the audience, you could go into some detail about what those were and why they were successful and what the track record in Europe has been for them. Yeah, over the, the last 10 or 15 years, uh, a, a couple of um, reform organizations like the Vera Institute have organized field trips for American corrections officials to go visit uh, Norway's popular, Germany's popular. We sent a reporter from the Marshall Project on a trip to Germany to visit the prisons along with the governor of Connecticut and a number of um, corrections chiefs from, from several states. And we're, we're, the United States is not Norway. I mean, Norway is a homogeneous, oil-rich welfare state, but uh, several um, um, more of the more innovative and open-minded corrections officials in specifically in Connecticut and uh, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, um, Oregon, and, and some others have designed programs that draw on the experiences of Scandinavia and Germany without trying to pretend that we're Germany or Norway. So it starts with a philosophy. And the philosophy is, yes, you should be punished for breaking the law, but your punishment is the, that you're deprived of freedom for a period of time, usually, by the way, a much shorter period of time than for comparable crimes in the United States. Um, so your, your punishment means you lose your right to go about your business freely, but in all other respects, you retain your rights as a citizen. You have the right to be safe. You have the right to um, an education. You have a, the right to work and to get paid for it. You have the right to vote in most, your, most of the more progressive European countries, uh, not just after you've served your time, but you can vote in prison. Um, I mean, it seems here like the main issue that has been talked about is outrage over, you know, ex-convicts losing the right to own a gun. Uh, it's, the debate has not been at a very, you know, complex or, or high level. Uh, right. The the program at San Quentin that you you write about um, involved like a kind of mentorship, you know, where lifers, you know, got prisoners 
you know, who have life sentences were kind of teaching life skills to those who were going to be free one day. And do, do you feel that showed a lot of promise? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that you're thinking of the, the Chester, Pennsylvania, Little Scandinavia project, although one element in most of these experiments is that they try to take the, the older, more mature prisoners and use them. I mean, one of the things that blows you away when you spend a little time in prisons is with the waste of human potential. Uh, and, you know, most of the lifers are, are, don't represent a threat to anybody. And they've, uh, a lot of them have taken college courses while they were incarcerated. Uh, and they, they have actual wisdom to share with the newer, newer inmates. You know, we, I've been kind of focusing on the conservative end of the spectrum where there is, you know, more of a kind of closed mind in terms of trying some of these things. But on the other end of the spectrum, and certainly among the students I teach at Harvard, there are a lot of younger people who believe that prison should be abolished in our country, that you know, mass incarceration has gotten so out of control. It so does not seem to rehabilitate in large numbers. And, you know, the, these younger people believe we should kind of start from scratch in our approach to criminal justice and specifically actually abolish prisons. And, you know, you make a, a, an interesting case that, you know, this is not like the movement to quote unquote defund the police, but, you know, is something that, that actually is getting some traction. And I was curious for you to say more about what you think about that. Yeah, the abolitionist movement has been around for a long, long time. I mean, a century at least, but it, it has gained a lot of popularity on college campuses. People who are in the criminal justice reform were doing that kind of work say that the abolition is, is, is maybe the fastest growing um, sector of the, of the anti-prison movement. I think First of all, the, the abolition movement deserves a lot of credit for having focused attentions on the fail, failures of the existing system. They were often ahead of the pack on, on those issues. Um, and another thing they, they do, which I admire, is it's, it's a lot of people who were criticizing mass incarceration pretend that the solution is uh, Nonviolent criminals. I mean, people who have who have not committed violent crimes, um, and the fact is that's a that's a dubious distinction because the Constitution wasn't invented for the pure of heart. Most of the people who are in prison are guilty; they're not innocent, and an awful lot of those who are guilty are guilty of violent crimes. Um, so the abolition movement gets some credit for focusing attention on the totality of the incarcerated population. I have two issues with them, two questions that I haven't heard answered, at least to, to my satisfaction. One of them is, is it realistic to imagine a world where there's violence goes away or goes down to such a level that you don't need law enforcement or, or prisons. Uh, and I sort of worry that if, if that day ever, ever came, which seems highly unlikely, but if it ever came, there's still gonna be laws and 
guidelines to, that society expects people to live up to. And if you don't have some version of police and courts and prisons, they'll have to be reinvented uh, by something that looks a lot like police and prisons. So that's one complaint I have, I guess, or one query I would have of the abolition movement. The other one is, if in the unlikely event that it, that this revolution takes place, it's not likely to take place for decades or generations. And what do you do about all the people who are trapped in the system in the meantime? Are they they're supposed to endure until the revolution comes? It's, it's hard to imagine. Yeah, how you would fairly figure out the order in which people would come out of prison. Uh, you, you know, in turn, back to rehabilitation for a minute, you had some firsthand experience with seeing, you know, what education, teaching life skills, teaching you know, writing, because many people in many prisoners discover a love of writing and that that becomes a very positive outlet. And you you taught um, at Sing Sing and could you share some of those experiences? Sure, My, I taught for a grand total of four weeks and then the pandemic hit and just shut the prisons down completely. I'm, I expect to be teaching again in the new year. Um, I, I, Sing Sing has a number of education programs. And by the way, the one, everybody's got conflicting data on what works in terms of rehabilitation, but the one where there's pretty universal agreement and, and really quality studies shows that education and particularly college level education is, is uh, really reduces recidivism. Um, you're much less likely to end up back in prison if you've gotten a college degree while you're in prison or, re or even just a, a skill. Um, my course was sort of an, I called it an introduction to news and it was some writing and editing uh, and a lot of kind of how to read skeptically um, my students, there are 16 students who signed up for the seminar. They were mostly in their 50s. There were all but one or two of them were either black or brown. Uh, and they had a kind of maturity about them that, um, that impressed me. Um, but you could also, I'll, I'll tell you one story. My first writing assignment, prior to Sing Sing, I taught a, for a semester at Princeton and a profile writing seminar. And I gave both, both of my classes the same assignment, which was to describe a scene that you witnessed. It can be anything, it can be from your childhood, from your in your pre-incarceration days or something that you witnessed in prison and try to bring it to life for me. Just take, give, paint me a picture in words. The, the, the essays I got from the Sing Sing students told you a lot about the, the role that trauma plays in the life of people who end up in prison. A couple of them were stories of children discovering dead bodies. Uh, one of them was about a teenager taken to a brothel for the first time. Two or three of them described the humiliation of a strip search. There was, a, of, the six, of the 16, there was one that described a happy event and that was a prisoner who Sing Sing has family visit rooms where you can be alone with your family. And he just, in the family visiting room, he discovered his favorite video game. That's about as cheerful as it got. 
I imagine there was a sharp contrast between those scenes and the Princeton students. Yeah. So, no dead bodies, no strip right. search. But in, in some ways, I'm sure, you know, that the, the descriptions upsetting and sometimes violent as they were, were more vivid and compelling than what, you know, privileged kids who have not experienced much trauma in their lives would write about. Uh, yeah. No, the Princeton students tended more to be uh, describing their job in the in the their summer job at the Starbucks or uh, watching a soccer game. Well, may, I suspect many of the people who are with us for this event have seen the the movie Thirteenth, which you know maybe five years ago now became you know a certainly a sensation among my students and a lot of the people that I know who are interested in criminal justice. And, you know, that that movie telescoped, you know, the the role of private prisons and, you know, the the wild amount of prison building that's gone on for for profit. You know, how, wh how much of a contributor to the system not working are private prisons? Um, well, I don't want to give the impression that the, the, the non-private prisons are all that much better. Um, there, there's been a- But, you know, that some of the private companies have just become notorious, like CCC and and a few others. That's right. A few years ago, Shane Bauer wrote a- CCA, sorry. Good book, wrote a, a, a good book. He went under, underground as a, as a guard in a CCA um, prison. Yeah, I, I assign the magazine version of that piece in my classes, and it's very eye-opening what he got to see, uh, getting a job in a private prison. Yeah, it's, I mean, the numbers aren't, aren't all that dramatic. That's something like 10% of the prisons are managed by private for-profit companies, but that doesn't tell the whole story because most prisons, whether they're run by hired guns or, or by the state, contract out all kinds of services to for-profit companies, transport, medical treatments, running the canteen, uh, one that's been much discussed re recently is telecommunications. They control how much you have to pay to take a phone call from, from your family. Um, so the profit, the, the profit motive has, has always been there to some, some extent. Um, you know, what the, about, you know, the, the profit motive in terms of using prisoners for unpaid labor, basically, to make stuff that's later sold? Yeah, well, that's the loophole in the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery with one rather notable exception, which was uh, you can enslave somebody, uh, it doesn't use that word, but you can make somebody do unpaid forced labor if they've been convicted of a serious crime. Yeah, uh, that's why the movie is called 13. Right. So. Right. You know, you you started to get into the the issue of race, which is indeed inescapable when you're talking about the US prison population. And you know, M Michelle Alexander, you know, wrote 
uh, an important and and best selling book a couple of years ago um, called The New Jim Crow. And you know, is is it your view that mass incarceration is the the equivalent of Jim Crow and the era of you know racist repressive law and treatment of of black citizens and in this case black prisoners yes i think she makes a really strong case for the continuum you had slavery and then you abolished slavery but instead of picking cotton for the state you picked cotton for the corrections department um and the the sharp right turn or punitive turn that the country took in the 70s, 80s, and 90s um, was in large part a reaction to the Black empowerment movement. Uh, I mean, the Blacks may make up 13% of the population of this country. And they make up almost 40% of the incarcerated population. Um, the one caveat that some other scholars like Bruce Western at Columbia and James Foreman at Yale add as a, as a kind of, they, they generally agree that this is sort of an, an echo of slavery. Um, but they, they caution that we shouldn't overlook the role of class um, in part because there's, there ought to be a large white constituency for reforming the prison system. Uh, since there are an awful lot of white people who are, and, and they shouldn't be, you know, if, if you treat, James Foreman puts it that it's a, it's, it, mass incarceration is a consequence of race and, and that you need the and, which may be class, maybe, maybe, Failure, failure to treat mental health could be. And you mentioned education. Uh, and lack of education, yes. Yeah. Some, some of the re reviews of of the book, which have been, you know, by and large, very, very good, and complimentary, have said about you, um, and your voice and attitude in this book that that you you are surprisingly optimistic and that this book about the era of mass incarceration which is asking what's prison for that you know you 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 are very hopeful that you know, programs that work elsewhere will take hold here. Would would you go along with um, the view of you as a optimist? Well, if by optimist you mean that I believe that the system will undergo some transformative experience or, or you know, wholesale reform, I'm skeptical of that because the system functions, the correction system functions as a kind of catch basin for all of society's problems, racism, poverty, mental illness. They all drain into the sewer that's the, the, system, the, the correction system. And until you make some headway in solving those problems of what happens outside of the prisons, before prison, there's not much chance of a major reformation of the correction system. So in that respect, I'm not optimistic, but I, I, the heroes in the book are people who are trying to do something anyway, who refuse to give up, who don't despair, and they make a difference. It's an incremental difference, but I think it's heroic. I'm talking not just about the teachers who volunteer and the, you know, the advocacy groups that that push for more humane treatment of people who are incarcerated. But I'm also thinking of the, the corrections uh, officials in those states that have 
gone to take a look at how they do it in Europe and have made, made an effort to create little pilot programs uh, or, or to even in, in Oregon, the, what they've tried to do is redefine corrections as a public health problem and to focus on um, the first and foremost, the health of the people who work there, the staff who often are sort of written off as Neanderthals, um, but who are in a sense victims of the system themselves. And, and they, so in Oregon, they've introduced wellness programs and tried to retrain to the extent that it's possible, retrain um, corrections officers to, to be a little more like social workers. Yeah, I think, you know, that what a question I had in reading about the pro the pro programs that are being experimented with in your book is I just wondered, like, can they scale? And is there, you know, a, a will to make them bigger and, and more common? Um, but I guess your answer to my question is that you're a quasi optimist. Would that be a fair description? Uh, I would say just drop the O word and say I'm hopeful. Okay, hopeful, okay. <laughs> Um, we, we have some questions from the audience, so I'm going to attempt to look at those and um, be your interlocutor for answering them. So here goes. Okay. Okay. The, the, the first question that we have is, are US military uniforms still being made by prisoners for wages as little as 23 cents an hour? Or are, are there other companies besides Unicor? Uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that question, whether, whether the, the, they, there's any subcontracting out to prison labor. Um, when that was first written about, what, 10 years ago, I guess, um, it, it was it provoked a fair amount of outrage. And there have been some reforms, at least in the federal system, in terms of the kind of labor that you can be compelled to do. The wages haven't gone up. Um, you're, you're still likely to be pay, paid 10 cents an hour or something. Um, right. That that relates to, you know, what we were just talking about. Uh, uh, the one thing that the, the, the prisons that I've looked at, talked about in Europe, one of their features is that they pay a living wage or something close to it so that when it comes time for prisoners to be to re-enter society, they're not going to be bankrupt. Right. And may have developed real skills that can help them get jobs. Right. Uh, the, it, we have a, a question actually relating to just that, which is, you know, a, 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 a person listening to us who was hopeful of um, meeting someone who could advise on how to pilot, you know, a kind of climate course for prisons, maybe, you know, program that could prepare them uh, for, you know, so-called clean energy jobs, uh, because, you know, the environment seems to be an area where, you know, there, there are some jobs for, for people. You know, anyone who kn knows anything about such a thing or, you know, a, a prison that would be open to maybe trying something focused on the environment? Well, if, if somebody has the skills and the time to devote to teaching in prison, the best way to, to get at it is to talk to one of the big 
organizations that have um, become pretty expert in organizing. At San Quentin, it's called Mount Tamalpais College. They've actually gotten the, uni the university is an accredited, I mean, the, the prison is an accredited university with its own degree granting possibilities. The, in the, on the East Coast, the Bard's, Bard Prison Initiative out of Bard College uh, is a good entry place. There are, there are lots of them. Um, there are some companies, aren't there? I'm talking beyond the environment that go out of their way to hire ex-prisoners and, you know, largely has, you know, the track record been pretty good where, you know, having a job and having an open door to employing former prisoners that that, that can work? It can. Um, I mean, the recidivism rate is discouraging to a lot of potential employers. I mean, those that's 600,000 people who are going to get out this year that I referred to earlier. Um, two thirds of them are likely to be rearrested within five years. Mm -hmm. That's because we haven't prepared them for life to, to live a different life than the one they were living before they went to prison. Um, Yeah, I wanted to just read something from the book to you and have you maybe elaborate a little bit, um, which is you're, you write that a society that celebrates reinvention and professes to believe in second chances has assured that a criminal's debt to society is rarely marked paid in full. What, what can you explain what, what you meant by that? There are literally thousands of collateral consequences that assure that when you get out, you take a lot of prison with you. Um, there are uh, one of my one of my students at Sing Sing actually got paroled this summer, um, and he has a wife who lives in Bayshore, a community off Manhattan. Uh, but she lives in federally subsidized housing, so he so her husband was not allowed to live with her. He was instead assigned to live with his mother, who lives in Buffalo, four hundred miles away. How, it's a lot of the that may seem like a petty requirement, but it's not petty to him. Uh, and right, you know, you you want to keep families together. Obviously, there are other restrictions in most states in, involving what uh, licenses you can get if you're going to start a business or if you're going to be a hair, hairdresser or an electrician if you have if you have the skills. Um, and then there's just the, the stigma that comes with being an ex-con. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, you, you were saying that that can be an inhibition to, you know, employers who are hesitant to hire these people. Uh, and you know, I, I'd feel remiss if I didn't ask you a specific question. You, you write some in, in the book, and I thought quite compellingly about women's prisons. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you would mind telling us, you, you, you cite um, a woman named Michelle Jones, who was in the Indiana women's prison uh, as you know, I guess one of the, the stories that that would give your readers some hope about, you know, the the many people, especially women who are returning to society from prison. Could you tell us about Michelle Jones, who she is, 
what yeah. what she did to be in prison and what what she did once she she left yeah indiana women's prison is a, a sort of anomaly in that it's it had a very smart and progressive woman who came in and started all these courses that um, were intended to give give the women research skills and present presentation skills. Michelle Jones was sort of her star pupil. Uh, she was incarcerated for having killed her four-year-old son. Uh. Uh, circumstances a little unclear. And she was, I've, I've forgotten the, the extent of her sentence, I think it was 20 years. Um, and in this program, she uh, earned herself a, 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 a degree in history. She um, testified remotely to, to the, the Indiana State Legislature on issues. Uh, and when, she, when her release date was coming up, she applied to graduate schools in, in history, a number of them. Um, one of them, one of them was Harvard. Yeah, and Har didn't Harvard turn her down? Well, Harvard first extended an offer to her. And then it, rescinded it. Then right. rescinded it, uh, at least in part because of what, what kind of reaction, the public reaction might be uh, to, to them hiring somebody who killed her child. Um, she ended up at um, NYU and has apparently been flourishing. Yeah, that, I could, that, that her case received, you know, some public notice and in newspapers at the time, but I mean, that, that's something. Uh, we did, we did that story at the Marshall Project and the New York Times published it on the front page. Uh-huh. That's right. Uh, what, one of the questions in our queue is, is a good one. It's, it's a difficult one. If you had to name one thing that the average person can do right now to further the cause of prison reform, what would it be? Well, it depends on what your resources are and you know, if, if you or, I guess the, the question infers that the resources are not great because it's the average person. Yeah. Well, you can write to your congressman and ask where he stands on prison reform issues like mandatory sentencing. Um, you can vote. It's, that's still, a, still something that's available to us. I don't know for how much longer, but... Uh, given the, the perilous state of government for democracy. Um, you can talk about it, read about it and talk about it. Um, you know, tell, tell your friends what you've, what you've learned from. Right, and community meetings and meetings that lawmakers have in their districts. Uh -huh. They need to know that it's at the top of people's minds, right? Yeah, and a lot of the programming that is aimed at lowering the the rate of return visits to prison is being done by philanthropic organizations um and you know you, you might want to pick a local one and if you do a, a sort of year-end gift however small you might want to include right an education and program or a re-entry program um, I don't want to sound like the marketing director for Columbia Global Reports, which published your book, but I would say, you know, it's a great primer for anyone who does want to take on the role of citizen lobbyist uh, for prison reform. It's, you know, full of both you know, very jarring statistics and great explanations of different roads that other countries have taken in 
trying to find um, a, a solution and a way out of throwing people in jail in massive numbers. So it's, it's, I'm very glad that you allowed your metabolism to adjust <laughs> so that you could write this. Uh, it, it's a quite wonderful book. Coming from somebody who actually writes full-size books, that's, that's, <laughs> I, think, I think that is high praise. That seemed like a perfect moment um, to jump back on camera and thank you both for this discussion. It was really fascinating and disturbing, <laughs> um, but in a good way. <laughs> um, but yeah, these issues are just very disturbing and important to, to learn about. So thank you both uh, for being here and Thanks to everybody out there who's listening um, and spending your evening with us. Please do check out the book at harvard.com. I've thrown the link into the chat a couple of times, so you can just click on over um, or just go to harvard.com and search Bill Keller and you'll be able to find it no problem. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Mass, thanks to our two wonderful speakers and keep reading, stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you.